welcome to My Baking Journey, a podcast for bakers where you get to hear from some of the great minds in the baking industry. My name is Haf. And my name is Rachel. I'm a baker. I know what it's like to be baking all day alone in my kitchen, experiencing the frustrations and struggles with no one else to guide or support me through it. And I'm not a baker. But I've witnessed all the ups and downs that come with this industry and where it's hard to get a little bit of extra help. So if you're looking for advice, tips and amazing insight from various experienced bakers, you've come to the right place. So let's give you a little insight into what's in store for you this week. Your business is a success because of the time you put in. I value myself and my business far more than just working myself into the ground just because my cupcakes are in this place in London. You lose yourself. I don't know if you find it. I didn't think about anything. I know it sounds ridiculous. When I pipe, I don't think about anything. Shut myself off from the world. Sometimes the kids can even be talking to me. I've not even acknowledged they're there. I go in my own little bubble when I'm doing it. I stood at the front of the room with all these people staring at me and my lips started to go. You know, you get that wobbly lip thing. And I was like, no, not now, not now. Good morning, Jane. How are you? Morning. I'm good, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast, My Baking Journey with Rachel and I. Honestly, we've been really looking forward to this. There's a few reasons you could say why, but ultimately, you know, you are somebody for us that we've come across very luckily. And we've been blown away by your talent, your drive, your determination, your honesty, and just your overall approach to running a business. And then we just thought, there's a lot here to unpack with you, and it would be great to get into some of this. You know, you gave out a lot of information to us previously, but there's also quite a bit of information of you on your website, yeah. which is really nice. I think what I want to do is first hone in on the, your business where you first started, because you were not always doing floral cupcakes or buttercream flowers or things like that, right? You started off as a standard cake business, is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, it all started because my, as you know, I've got five kids and my youngest, Oliver, went to school when I thought I'd be, you know, enjoying the free time, ladies at lunch and all that. Well, all my ladies work. So it was within, you know, no time. It became so boring. And I spoke to my friends who are actually at Rockpool Creative, who you probably know, Fran and Emily. And they said, just do some baking. You know you love baking. So I did that. They set up the Facebook page for me and it literally flew from day one. I don't know what it was. I had orders within days of starting up the business. But like you said, it was, I don't mean just because that belittles what people do. Yeah. They were like flavoured cupcakes, so salted caramel, and then you put chocolates on top and I'd do selection boxes and things like that. But after a time, it got boring, if I'm being honest. It was sort of quite monotonous, you know, and I wanted something to sort of drive me more. And then I came across floral cupcakes. First person I saw was Cupcake Gemma. I don't know if you've seen her. She's one of Jamie Oliver's mm. finds as such. And she did a hydrangea. I've got her book. It's amazing. I like Cupcake Gemma. Brilliant, isn't she? She's brilliant. And she had piped some hydrangeas. And I thought, well, that looks easy. I'll have a go at that. And literally got the bug. So I then typed up floral cupcakes online. And I came across Dawn Davis. She owns Dee Dee's Cupcakes down in... Devon, I think she is, or Paynton, somewhere like that. And she made them into a bouquet. And I was like, that is insane. That is literally insane. So I contacted her straight away to find out how she constructed the bouquet. So I went on a online course for that, which was literally half an hour, which shows you how to do it. And that's where my bug started. Are you the type of person then where you are the sort of like you come across something, you feel like you've mastered it, you want to move on? To the next thing is that what caused that's what caused that boredom at the beginning it's just the monotony I like to go out of my comfort zone all the time I'm quite happy to push myself you know even doing this if you'd said to me I don't know what I've been doing the business seven years now seven years ago I'd have been no I'm not doing that you know it's just having <laughs> your face on something you know I'd be like no way because I've always been confident but certainly not on camera it was an absolute no-no but I love pushing myself and obviously, when I saw these Royal Cup cakes, I was like, I could do that. I know I can do that. And then even got bored of that, if I'm being honest, because they were quite simple. Yeah. For me, they were like sort of simple, basic. And I wanted to get to the point where they looked like a real bunch of flowers. That's been my aim from day one, 
was for them to fool people to think that they were actually flowers and not cakes. Does that obsession to perfect something come across in other parts of your life as well? Uh, are you driven to perfect things or has it just been this obsession with floral cupcakes? Always, always. Even, I suppose, in some ways, I have an OCD for cleaning everything being, everything has a place. I'm the same. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Have. <laughs> yeah, I've always been very sort of, you know, I'm very routine based. I do all my jobs, do my house. My house has to look perfect all the time, which is not easy with five kids. And now a granddaughter put in the mix as well. And I'm the same with the cakes. Every aspect of my life, it doesn't have to be perfect. I don't aim for perfection. But I like things to be a certain way. Mm. And that's always been my drive. It's interesting that, isn't it? My mum's a keen gardener and I always show her pictures of your florals. And she is always looking at them going, oh, I wonder how she grew those. And, and <laughs> oh, it's, that's it's, lovely. See, that's the best they're compliment not real. ever. That's the best compliment ever. <laughs> I know nothing. I have no green thumb. None of it came down to me. But I remember seeing um, a range of stories from you one day where you walk through every single flower and I just felt like I'd walked out of a gardening centre. Oh, I like told Rach later, I was like, this is great. I've learned about peonies. I've learned about hydrangeas. I've learned about Thank this. you. That's, that's a massive compliment. Thank you. We have a quote from you. I'm going to read this out. And I think this is quite fitting to your story and your approach and, and you say that it's all down to your mindset and how much practice you're prepared to put in yeah and when i think about what you're saying there if you can give us a bit of background into this i think you're you looked at those florals and you said i can do that and i have this feeling that a lot of people look at those and say i can't do that yeah i think a lot of that is i did the same when i used to look at other people's vlogs obviously once you open that daughter floral cupcakes if you go on the internet for it it's, there's thousands of people that do what I do they do exactly the same job I do and when you look when I first started I did have elements where I was like I'd love my bouquets to look like that one day mm. but I'm also prepared for the fact that none of this is overnight none of this you know doing your own business yourself none of it is overnight your business is a success because of the time you put in that's it it's down to practice and everything now, mindset wise, I've always been quite positive in the sense that to me, you get back what you give. So, you know, the more time I put in, the more effort I put in, the better your business will be. And it's been like that from, for me from day one. The more I practiced, the better I got, you know, and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. There were days when I literally threw the whole lot out the window, quite literally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not been an easy ride, that's for sure. You know, I've had many days where I've been in tears and rocking in the corner, you know, thinking I'm never going to be able to do this. But you do. You just push through it and have a good mindset because all the time you're, oh, I can't do this. I'll never be able to do that. No one will ever buy them. You're giving off that wrong aura, I suppose, is I think being positive and being bubbly and being confident in your business mm -hmm. is essential. That's what drives people to come to you and making you you more relatable that's why I talk about my family all the time that it is possible I have five kids that live here and a baby and a dog and I still run the business from home <laughs> it is doable Jane you're an absolute inspiration on that side because I think for me like the pressure of trying to master something we have two kids and obviously our business but there's time constraints right there's only so many hours in the day yeah. and half will agree with me here but I, I used to get quite stressed out if I only had two hours to try and master something and it didn't turn out perfect I walked away really annoyed with myself that I hadn't done it it was a waste of time and now I've got to deal with the baby and go do something else when all I want to do is fix that problem that I yeah I've done my, my personality is like the same as yours I want to master it and if I've not mastered it I want to keep going at it relentlessly. Yeah. But with children and a family in the mix, you can't do that. So how did you balance that obsession to keep getting better with time constraints? I worked through the night. Yeah. <laughs> I did wait till the kids were down. You got no distractions because like you said, when you're say trying to, even if you're piping an order and the kids are going, I'm really hungry, I want lunch or, you know, the washing needs to be done or... You've got to go then collect them from school or something like that. 
So I found by the minute I put them in bed, there's no distractions. Mm. I just shut myself in my cake room. Well, I didn't have a cake room at the time. I was in my family kitchen. Um, so dinner was done. All the worktops were clear. And I could just focus solely on that. Now, I'm lucky in the sense that I don't need a lot of sleep. I can function on no sleep. Alexia, our fourth child, didn't sleep for 11 years. So we're used to no sleep, literally no sleep. So I just used to work through the night. But by, like I said, by having no distractions, used to put my AirPods in, put my music on, and I'd pipe away. Mm. That was when. But obviously that isn't doable for everyone. If you've got a tiny baby, the last thing you need to be doing is sitting up piping all night. But that's how I got round it was by working through the night. Not right through, obviously. I finished sort of, I don't know, sometimes one in the morning. But by having that sort of eight to one, that's quite a concentrated amount of time just to focus on one thing. So that's how I did it. Did you find it a bit of an outlet and a release to family life or something that you could put your brain into? Yes. You lose yourself. I don't know if you find it. I didn't think about anything. I know it sounds ridiculous. When I pipe, I don't think about anything. I literally just pipe shut myself off from the world. Sometimes the kids can even be talking to me. I've not even acknowledged they're there. I go in my own little bubble when I'm doing it. So yes, it for me, it's a massive therapy and me time. Mm. So when you started doing the, the florals, obviously, and you got better and you improved, was the intention always to then teach that skill? No, never, never, ever. It boils down to that thing that I always talk to you about how and looking for signs when you have enough people on a daily basis saying do you teach and to begin with I was like no I don't no thank you the thought of standing in front of a room of people literally made my blood run cold but you have to read the signs if enough people are saying it to you you need to facilitate that need Mm. and that's when I started the workshops I didn't do it online to start with it was purely doing workshops around here around my area and that when I released those that sold out within two hours I'd sold out completely. And how did you find it? I mean, after you went through the process versus your apprehension? It was awful. The first, I obviously went into this, hired this venue, which was beautiful. It's called the Secret Garden in Ashford. It's a beautiful venue, massive room we had. And I had uh, 12 students and I was all prepped. I was like, yeah, no, exactly what I'm doing. I had an itinerary of how I was going to do it. Then I stood at the front. It's making me shake now. I stood at the front of the room with all these people staring at me and my lips started to go you know you get that wobbly lip thing oh, wow. and I was like no not now not now because I'm not a crier I'm really not so just for me to have that wobbly lip thing I was like no, no no I can't do this and I just went give me a second just need to go to the bathroom and I was like went into the bathroom spoke to myself I was like you are being ridiculous these people just want to pipe you know how to do it yeah you can do it went back had the best class ever they Loved it. They absolutely loved it. They all went home with a box of 12 beautiful cupcakes, which they've never done. A lot of them hadn't even picked up a piping bag. And they went home with 12 floral cupcakes. So that sort of adrenaline at the end, me and Fran both burst into tears. The relief, I think, more than anything. And pride, if I'm being honest. I was really proud of myself. I am a confident person, but not to speak in front of that many people and try and share my skill. Yeah, it's making my voice go now. It's weird. It's a really, it's a really funny feeling. I'm sure. I mean, it's almost like you you were presented with this, you know, this students and this classroom environment, but you hadn't properly prepared yourself for what was about to hit you until no. that moment that you stood there. And it takes a bit of a discussion of yourself just to yeah. say, "All right, this is your turning point. You can either run out the door, yeah, and never show your face again, or you can go back in there and face it." Exactly that. And overcome it. It goes back to your quote, right? It's like, how much effort are you willing to put in to make this work? Because you know you can do it. And also, I think what's very clever is you picked out the fact that people are just here to bake and make cupcakes. They're not here for anything else. So (laughs) you that's what you do. I know how to do it. So just get on with it. Do you know what I mean? It's just just do it. It's very true. Yeah, and then I booked more classes after that. They all sold out. But then there became a point, obviously, where people abroad, I did have people come from overseas to my classes, but financially that's not doable for, you're cutting out such a massive proportion of people Mm -hmm. who can't afford to fly over, you know, and have a class. And that's when the online thing started to develop. I see. But this this was never part of the business plan, obviously. Like I said, so you're reading the signs, you're following this. And then when it came to, obviously, then, from the business perspective, your business is getting bigger yeah. at this point. You're still a one-woman show at this point? 
no, Fran and Emily have always been on board so far as guiding me marketing wise. Okay. Always. They set up my Facebook page, Twitter, stuff like that. I never had a website then. You didn't need one. That's one thing I would say to anyone who's first starting out, do not invest in a website. They are thousands. Mm. Certainly not at the beginning. Mm. Not at the beginning. You need to get your following up, get your you know, get a good client base up first, then look into going to a website. But that obviously quickly happened because of the on as soon as I started teaching really, that's when the websites all kicked in and they massively became part of the business and that's when I took them on because I couldn't do it on my own. It wasn't possible. Mm. Can we talk about your relationship with Fran and the uh, Rockport Creative? Because it seems like these ladies um, are being important role models for you or or friendship networks or people to rely on and to lean on. But both from a professional point of view and a personal, like almost when you got into doing your first teaching lesson, they were there around you, supporting you, raising you up. Is yeah. That's the impression I get. Yeah, absolutely. There's a group of six of us, five ladies and one man. We're all very close, very, very close. We've been through a lot together. I'm the oldest out of all of them. I'm the mother head of them all, I suppose. Yeah, and we're a very tight-knit group. And the basis of our friendships is obviously... We are each other's biggest cheerleaders. That's how, again, how Bacon Cheerleaders came about. If your people that are surrounding you are not your cheerleaders, they are not your friends at the end of the day. My friends big me up to everyone as I do them with their businesses. We're all entrepreneurs. That's the other thing. Every single one of us six are entrepreneurs. We all have our own businesses. Again, Fran and Emily, Fran's got three kids. She's wanted a job that enabled her to be with her children, same as me. So... Fran was already doing marketing. She'd sort of just started and it all just sort of came together. That's how it all came together. And we are each other's biggest cheerleaders. That's what it boils down to. We all benefit from my business. I know it sounds awful. I don't mean it like that, but they obviously get work off of my yeah. company. And there's other people now. They've developed another sister company called um, Rock Cake to help all the bakers with their websites, you know, and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a win-win for all of us. Well, you know, the marketing side of it for you has worked out quite well. I love that uh, you've been tweeted by a former dragon, you know, as part of the uh, Small Business Sunday Challenge with Theo Peters. Uh, yeah, I, I won one of those, yeah. That was fantastic. I mean, yeah. give us an idea about how that came about, why what inspired you to go do that and what, what came from it as a result. Well, obviously, Rock Paul put me, you have to put your business to him. So on a Sunday, you tweet something about your business. Okay. We've done it loads of times. and. We both, it was funny, we both said this Sunday, I don't know why, but I feel like I'm going to get it this Sunday. I've not been obnoxious. We both felt it. We're quite, we're quite spiritual. We know when something's coming. We know when something good's going to happen. We always just know. Yeah. And yeah, I got suddenly got started getting thousands of tweets. I was like, what is going on? Oh, we actually won it. Um, so it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So with that, you get to go to his annual event, which is in Birmingham. And they have the most amazing speakers there that just drive you. I can't tell you how inspiring it is. I'm not so much with the the networking. I know it sounds awful. I'm not really one for networking with other people as such. Certainly not if it's nothing to do with what business I'm doing. Mm. But it's worth going just to hear the speakers and how even Theo, when Theo did his talk, he was saying he lost his house and everything. He had to go home one day and tell his wife he'd lost everything. And they had kids and everything and how he built himself back up and just the little bits of wisdom that stay in my brain all the time. Stuff he says, keep the cash flow, keep the cash flow, you know, and things like that. They've just lodged in my brain. So it's worth it just to go to that event. You get to go every year. Once you've won, you get to go every single year. So you get to hear all this other, you know, advice and wisdom from other people that have got businesses like ours. Does he still run the, the annual conference? Yeah, that's amazing. Honestly, it's amazing. It's literally amazing. And where could our viewers, listeners go find out about that? It's literally on Twitter. Oh, Twitter. It's only on Twitter. So follow Theopathetis SBS Small Business Sunday, it's called. And you put your business forward um, with a tweet and then see who gets chosen. That's basically what it is. Yeah, it was it was a massive moment that was, I must admit, to be recognised, you know, and acknowledged almost. That's what was lovely. Amazing. 
you know, that sounds like that. Obviously, you got lucky enough to go to this, and you go every year, and you can pick up all these nuggets of information because there's, I am sure, there's a lot of stuff that you've been now privy to that most of us who are running these small businesses would probably never even come across this bit of advice unless we ran into the right person and had experience. So maybe we can delve into that a bit. Can you give us, um, let's talk about one key area that's always a struggle for bakers, right? And that's around pricing strategy yeah. and valuing your self-worth and understanding there is a piece to that. How have you changed in your journey when it comes to that particular topic? If you go back to when you started to where you are today. I've always had the same mindset when I started. Now, when I was first in discussions with Rock Paul, we were talking about how I'd price the cupcakes. I was outraged at what Fran was suggesting because you know as well, Rachel, how much the cakes cost to make. Pittance is what they cost to make, really, don't they? You know, in the grand scheme of it. And I could never understand someone wanting to pay that much for something they could buy somewhere else for two pounds, mm. for example. And I, what I had to learn was. Like anything else, if your car needs fixing, you don't try and do it, do you? You pay someone else to do it because they know what they're doing. You probably don't even question the price, the same as I don't. I have my car cleaned. I could do it myself. I don't want to. So I pay someone else to do it. It's no different. And I soon got out of that because the minute I put the prices up, up as they were at the time, the orders were flooding in. So I was like, well, they clearly don't have a problem mm. paying that. You know, obviously with the basic cupcakes to start with, they were obviously cheaper than what I charged for my floral cupcakes because they are art at the end of the day they're not your average pricing structure so when I first tell my students about setting up you can look at other bakers in your area to see what they're charging Mm. but what you need to remember is we are appealing to the gift market it's not the cake market because say like half of you example wanted to bunt 12 say chocolate cupcakes from me yeah they would be for you and your family people don't come to me to buy a bouquet for themselves no so it's a gift. So the gift market needs to be higher. People want to pay more for something that they say given to their mother if it's their mum's 60th birthday. They want it to be all singing, all dancing. So the price needs to reflect that. I understand. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but I have to ask. You know you're about to go bake a cake, right? A really nice tall cake with some beautiful decorations on top, maybe some dried blooms, lovely toppers. What are you going to box that in when you give it to the customer? Please don't tell me you're going to have to put some extenders on and staple it to a standard box and then wrap the thing in plastic and give that to somebody hoping for the best. I have a better idea. Why don't you look at Olber tall cake boxes? 14 or 20 inches tall. They're gorgeous and strong. You can put them together in just a minute. Just amazing. You'll find them a game changer as a baker. Check them out www.olba.shop. All right, let's get back to the show. And how have you managed that, Jane? Because if I think about when I started charging for my cakes, I think originally, obviously, as you go along, you get better and better. So to begin with, it was yeah, family and friends and freebies and just so I could get up to a certain skill level. But I remember, yeah, I mean, even recently... I've had like pushback on cake prices. Like people are just astounded and like how much I would charge for a cake and they expect that cake price to be somewhere in the same market as a supermarket cake, which would get for like 10, 20 pounds. Yeah. I think one way I started off was I put my price in upfront on my website that cakes start from this amount of money. So I wouldn't get that initial pushback the time wasters basically yeah but obviously in instagram and facebook you still get lots of requests coming through so i mean has your pricing changed throughout that journey and what advice would you give back to other cake makers and what what their pricing strategy should be and how to deal with those scenarios where someone says i can't pay that uh, that's too expensive right so to begin with you always always write introductory price. So that allows you that room to grow without people sort of going, well, they were £20 last week. Why are they now 35 You know, <laughs> or something like that. By putting introductory price, it's obvious that you're going to be increasing at some point. Now, my bouquets weren't that much cheaper than they are now when I first started. But I knew the more detailed my work got, 
the more expensive it needed to be, that's when my three pricing structures came into play. So classic, deluxe, luxury. So people had a choice. So if they're on a tight budget, they could have the cheaper version almost, which sounds awful. That's belittling it. They're still beautiful, but they're not, they haven't got the details. So obviously, I haven't put the time in for them. Yeah. So I used to have that all the time. I actually ended up in a massive row with a lady on Facebook through the pricing because she wanted to pay a pound a cupcake. So my answer was, go to Tesco's, darling, if you want to pay that much, because I do not have time for it. You know, and you think, look at what you are asking me to make. And it's to me, it's just an insult to say that they're worth a pound a cupcake. It wouldn't, I wouldn't even turn my oven on for that much money. So it's being yeah. confident in your pricing and confident about your brand. This is all it's about. You know, my pricing structure is what it is. I do not alter on it ever. Even if someone says, you know, I've only got X amount of budget to spend, I will then offer them either the classic range or my elegance range. So always have something that's you know is only going to take you a very short amount of time so you can still cater for that person. Did you find like the cupcakes more profitable for you than just doing big cakes? Or was it just a passion for you wanting to go into more cupcakes? Oh, big cakes broke me out into a sweat, Rachel. <laughs> My husband said if I didn't stop doing them, he would literally divorce me. <laughs> the last one I did was on the hottest day of the year. Um, what was it? Five, six years ago. I had to do a gluten-free semi-naked cake. And as I was doing it, the cake was literally going on a landslide. <laughs> yeah, I was sweating. <laughs> I felt sick. I was shouting at everybody because I was like, I'm literally going to ruin this bride's wedding. Literally going to ruin it. And there was nothing I could do. But thank goodness she wanted loads of real greenery around it. So I literally packed the thing with greenery to try and uh, like eucalyptus or whatever to try and hold the cake up. And that's when my husband said, enough's enough. You don't enjoy it. Why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Why are you doing something you hate? This business is is to give us a tiny bit of extra money. It was just to give us more disposable income. So why are you stressing out over something that you don't enjoy doing, basically? And they're not profitable. For me personally, big cakes are not profitable. The beauty with the cupcake bouquets and cupcakes in general is the turnaround is so quick. Like, for example, I can do a seven bouquet in 15 minutes, start to finish. Mm. That's good profit. That order's out the same day. You're not prepping for that order days in advance, you know, getting, say, the sugar flowers ready or getting all the fondant figures you need to do. It's all, that's days, isn't it? It's sort of prep. Yeah. And then you get a very small amount of money in return. It's not worth it. Whereas the bouquets, for me, it wasn't worth it. For the bouquets, it's you do it, you pipe it, off it goes. It's gone. It's literally gone that day. Yeah, amazing. So to have that sort of turnaround, that's what I wanted. So how did you like manage your time on that? Did you prep a lot of things in advance? Like, Will you bake cupcakes in advance and freeze them and make buttercream in advance and freeze it? And I do all of that. Yeah, that's what my Mondays are about. Mm. I don't work on a Monday, as in when I was... Obviously, I don't bake at all now for customers, but when I did... I did all my prep for the entire week on a Monday. So I'd bake hundreds of cupcakes, put them in the freezer. I'd get kilos and kilos and kilos of buttercream made, popped in the fridge. If I knew what orders I had in, I had all the bouquets assembled ready. I had everything cut ready. I had the labels done, bows assembled. So all I had to do was get the buttercream out of the fridge, get the cupcakes out of the freezer and pipe. And I guess by having that routine in place, if one of your child becomes sick or something happens unexpectedly, it's almost like I just need to make sure I carve out 15, 30, 45 minutes. And that could be at any time of the day to get this done because we all know the unexpected always happens, right? Yeah. So so by you prepping everything at the beginning of the week, it kind of eliminates any issues that may come in Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Exactly. Well, the main reason I used to do it was because a lot of my students don't like the fact that people ask for last minute requests. Mm. Now, they were my bread and butter. Last minute requests were my bread and butter. Certainly when I first started, I used to work literally seven days a week, nine till whenever I finished, because I had a few orders in the book. And I always used to think at the beginning of the week, oh, I haven't got much in. But I knew that people would ask me last minute. Now, being able to facilitate that, then in turn gives you loyal customers because you've helped them out in a situation where they've forgotten their mother's birthday, even though they've known for an entire year. But anyway, they've forgotten their mum's birthday. You can facilitate for that for them and they'll always come back to you. They will then tell other people about you. So it's worth it. 
So a lot of my students don't like it. They get sort of almost outraged that someone would ask last minute, I don't suppose you could do this for me. Now, I used to love doing this because if it was last, last minute, as in they needed something that day, I would always say, absolutely. Because number one, I've got the freeze, the cupcakes in the freezer already, bus cream's ready. I've literally got to pipe whatever I want. Mm. And I would say, yes, I can facilitate this for you, but I need to have free reign, as in I can only do what I can do. And that gives you your opportunity to pipe something new, which then in turn gives you new images for social media, stuff like that. So it's a... It's a win to me. It was always a win-win. I could practice something new if I wanted to. Wanted to try a different colour range, and they were over the moon because they've got something for their mother. And I guess that takes away that. I think that when I was starting my cake business, it was almost like I don't know when my orders are going to come in. Or some weeks it would be slower. Some weeks it would be heavier. Yeah. And I guess by you prepping everything and probably having some standard cupcake flavours in your freezer ready to go. You've got buttercream on a weekly basis. So you can say, I've got vanilla cupcakes and I've got vanilla buttercream. It means that you can handle those last minute orders without feeling that stress and anxiety that comes when you have those quiet weeks and handling that pressure as well. Yeah. The thing is you're in control. I think that's the biggest thing. And again, something I I love about Onis. I'm the one that runs your business. So many of my students and followers talk to me about the customer's sort of demanding certain things this is your business you know it's very easy for me it's very easy to say no for something I've never had an issue with saying no sorry I can't do that or whatever it is because quite often you'll get you'll probably know Rachel when you've had orders come in where they ask for something really extravagant and I look and I think no I can't do that that is just it's not an option but I always have an alternative to offer them and they'd always say yes always I still get big cake requests on a daily basis literally every day. But when I was working, I used to offer them the bouquets instead. 99% of them would say, yep, great, thank you, and take that. Mm. Hey, let's talk about your brand, because you mentioned brand quite a bit. And I remember when we first met you in person at Cake International last year, you told us an interesting story about your decision not to go with selling through a well-known London retail house. I won't name them, but they're pretty well known because... You can if you want, I don't, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> but uh, there was just some things there you just weren't willing to do. Can you give us a bit more behind that story and like why you were doing it? Yeah, well, we were approached by this company, the big green place in uh, London, green department store. Now, I thought it was spam. I ignored about three emails for them because I thought it was just like junk mail. And then Fran opened it from the fourth time was like, no, this is actually them. And I couldn't, literally couldn't believe it. They wanted my floral cupcakes in there. There's like this big gold case display there. In, in the food hall kind of thing. Yes. So I nearly said the name then. I'm probably not allowed to, am I? Now, the cakes they had there were shocking, if I'm being honest. I thought how they're charging, what they're charging for what was there just blew my mind, completely blew my mind, which is why they wanted me to come in to do, offer something different, you know, and obviously it would look beautiful in one of those counters. Now, it all went amazingly well until it came to basically sign on the dotted line. They'd almost backtracked on what they were saying. I said what I wanted for the cupcakes per cupcake. And they sent me a thing saying they wanted to pay basically a pound a cupcake. It was just less. Now, bear in mind, they were selling those eight pounds a cupcake. Now, I understand it's a big department store, but to me, it was an insult. And I could make more money at home myself. So why would I do that now I had obviously a lot of friends and family not obviously my best friends so I was like oh you're mad you know that it's like the most famous department store and I was like I value myself and my business far more than just working myself into the ground just because my cupcakes are in this place in London yeah which probably sounds really obnoxious but I do you know I would never have seen my children which was not the aim of this business I did this so I could still be present in my kids lives So by doing that, I would have had to have employed three or four people with a volume of cakes that they wanted, and I would never have seen my children. Yeah. So I turned it down. Well, you stayed very true to your desires and intent, not driven by name, association, or... No. You know, you saw very quickly through it, especially when they met... I guess they also made it quite clear for you when they're offering you a pound for your cupcakes, and then they want to turn it around and sell it for eight. I mean... You know, like you say, it's an insult. And I feel like you did, obviously you did the right thing here. But I just think there's such a valid 
experience in that approach to say that, you know, not every opportunity is going to be the best one. No, you will have failures. You have to fail to succeed. You have to. Because of I made a massive failure when I even went there, if I'm being honest, because of what was happening. I then took on my cake studio. It's a huge cake studio about 20 minutes from here. Because obviously for me to do that job, I couldn't do it in my home to mm-hmm. facilitate 25,000 cupcakes a week. Right. It wasn't possible. So I took on the cake studio without signing the contract. Ah, uh, okay. So that was my one of my biggest failures. But it didn't matter in the sense that it gave me more room to teach. You know, when I was teaching my classes, they had vast amount of room. It was perfect. And it made my house become my home again rather than work as well. Mm. So that side of it was nice. But then obviously the pandemic hit. So no one was teaching. You know, you couldn't meet anybody. So I let it go. But it's been nothing but better since I've come back home. That was terrible. You know what I mean? My business has thrived. I obviously needed to be home. I needed to be in my own home, my own environment, and the business has just gone crazy. How did you have to adjust when the pandemic hit then? If you're, you obviously let go of the cake studio, but you still were, or you were already teaching at that point. Yeah. So is that where you proliferated more focus online and got it out internationally? Yeah. I mean, it was already going crazy online anyway, but obviously during the pandemic, people were at home, they were bored, and I think what the pandemic did was make all of us stop and think about life, didn't it? You know, almost Mm -hmm. as cheesy as that sounds, it made you think, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, for a lot of my students, they didn't want to be filling other people's pockets and hating their job, leaving their children every day to go and get paid pittance when they could Mm -hmm. do this, you know, run their own business. I think it was 183 businesses were started during the pandemic for my courses. Wow. People left full-time work. Incredible. So that is one of my proudest moments. And is that where you see your business going in the future, Jane? Is teaching an online platform rather than actually building, selling cakes to big retail outlets? Or I'd never be a supplier. What that taught me was I would never, ever be a supplier for anybody. Mm. Because obviously they've got to make money, haven't they? Yeah. It doesn't matter who it is, whether it's a farm shop or a little cake shop up the road, a cafe, sorry, up the road. They've still got to make money, so you're still going to be paid pittance for what you're making. Yeah. That's what, that's what that taught me. Never again would I be a supplier for anybody. Where do you see your business going then in the future? Just more of what I'm doing now, more businesses opening. There's probably an element to it that you don't know yet because you could easily go back and say in 2015 when you started, there's no way you knew you were doing all this that you do now, right? No, but I don't know if you do it. It's that hippie thing again. You're visualising where you're going with it. There's nothing hippie about it, Jane. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong. Yes. And we write it down. No, no, no. Everyone thinks I'm a bit like Luke de Lou when uh, they finish this podcast. We write down stuff that we predict to happen and we want to happen. Yeah. Cake International was on the 2015 list that we wrote. And I went to Cake International. Jane, can you talk through for our listeners and viewers when you start, what you do when you start creating a vision board? Because I think there'll be a lot of people very interested in this. Um, I know it's a topic that I love as well. But can you just talk us through it, what you do? It's not so much a vision board. I suppose it is. It's more writing down what I would like to happen. But I even do that with my family. It's not just, if you write stuff down, it happens. And you keep reading it every day, it happens. So like I said, we Rockpool, we said we write lists every year. Every year we have a meeting. Right, what do we want next for business? And I'll say, well, I'd really like this to happen. Right, put that down. The book was in the 2015 list. We're in the middle of writing a book, stuff like that. So you just keep where you want your business to be, you write it down. So you, I would write, I want to teach to Cake International. I would like to run my own show. Yeah. Take that what you want from that. I can't say any more about that. <laughs> and just more students opening businesses. For me, it's sharing my knowledge and allowing other people, not just women, men and women, because I do have male students, just become their own bosses. It's so empowering. It's so empowering and sharing it. Now, when I first started, I started teaching. I had friends and family go nuts that I was sharing my knowledge with people. They're like, what are you doing? I can't believe you're, you're going to lose business. No one will come to you. And it's like, it's not how it works. It's not how it works at all. For me, being able to do this, still be present for my children and 
earning to the volume that I am now. I'd never thought that would happen, I must admit, to what how the business has gone. But being able to share that and let someone else have a piece of that, to me is, well, I, I do abundance thinking, so I don't know if you know what I mean by that. Explain that, just so that we all know. Giving out more than you get back. You know, there's not everyone pays for my courses. Quite often I speak to a lot of people and I will give them my courses because I want them to succeed. If they're on the bread line, but they need to do this, that or the other, or they've got health issues and they want to be able to work from home, I give them courses. I give them that initial boost yeah. and they've all started businesses. Phenomenal. It just takes one thing sometimes, one tiny thing to be the catalyst for somebody to go forward and make that next step, Yeah, which is amazing. I mean, I've even seen you pop up on a story and say, right, today I'm going to show you how I do this flower. And this is such a simple gesture for a minute for me to just sit and watch and learn something. And there's nothing in that where it says, well, great, I'm going to go now copy her business and go and try and beat her business. There's nothing of that that's sinister or anything. You're providing value, a service, you're sharing knowledge, you're giving people thoughts and ideas on new things they can try that will only attract them to you more to then go say, okay, what else has she got? I'm going to go look at all the... And I, actually, I quite like on your website that you break down your courses down to the individual flower yeah. so that it could just be one thing that somebody wants to learn and they don't have to sit through everything else. Yeah, but again, you listen to your customers. You know, before I did more individually, I've always sold them individually because you might have a baker who knows how to do loads of buttercream flowers, but they don't know how to do a peony. So why would they buy a massive course yeah. when they just need the peony? So we did them all individually to start with. And then we got millions of people saying, can you not just bunch them all together? So I don't want to go on and buy separately. I'd rather just have it all in one course. Yeah. So we then did that. So you just, again, it's that constant evolving, listening to your customers, listening to the um, negative comments as well. You know, you need to listen to what's going on in your business. Don't be sort of blinkered, you know, thinking, no, this is how I want to do it. You need to listen to your customers. What sort of negativity do you get, though, from your comments on this? Is, is it is it in the sense of people just can't do it? Or they? what's the negative side of this business so far that you've experienced then? Oh, I don't really have masses of negativity like that. Um, we do have quite a few rude people who seem to think that they can speak to Fran and Emily like terribly. Yeah. But as soon as my name goes at the bottom of the email, they're all lovely, gushy, and I don't like it. It's not something you treat my ladies the same as you treat me. Yeah. They're no different. They're not my skibbies. They have their own business. They run like 30 other social media platforms for people. It's not just mine. You know, treat them with respect. We get that that side of it yeah when i say negative it wasn't negative people would just go look this is really difficult trying to choose what's beginners what's this what's that where do i start you know so that's when we stop we all get together right this needs to be in here this is this is what you do you have to be constantly evolving and listening and it, it sounds like that's where your tribe of friends have been like essential for you right so actually having people around that can listen and give advice and so you're not having to come up and listen to all of that yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, it's obviously easier for them because it's not their business. They don't get wounded, say, as much as you would, you know. But getting back to the Dragon's Den thing, Dragon's Den, the Theo Petus thing, one of the speakers on there was Sarah Davis. You know the lady I mean? Yeah, from Dragon's Den too, right? Yeah, she was one of the speakers one year. And again, it's one little bit of information I got from her that I've kept was running your business with your head and not your heart. There's so much you can take personally with this business, you know, like you get wounded all the time, whereas you have to see it. This is a business I'm running. All these negative comments and stuff people are saying, it's not aimed at me. They're just, well, it's trolling, isn't it? You get trolling at the end of the day, which I have to deal with on a daily basis. But to me, they are irrelevant. I don't even, I almost laugh now. I just scoot past and don't even acknowledge it because I'm running a business. Do you think your students miss out on a lot of this or are you making that now a part of this education plan for them? That I've always spoken about it, always spoken about it. Every every bit of knowledge I have, I tell my students. Now, if, I do, if they haven't heard it from me on stories, it's all on my blogs. I literally have a blog for every scenario known to man. Anything that I've come across or, again, if I get enough students keep saying, I don't know what to do about this, which is why I've started to doing the free downloads of how to plan your week, pricing structures, because 
despite the amount you talk about it, yeah. there's still other people that missed it or don't still don't quite get it. So we now do it in a free download and there's blogs on absolutely everything. I share everything I know, I will share to whoever. It's phenomenal. You're amazing, Jane. <laughs> it's so good. Well, listen, what we're going to do is we, we've got a few minutes left on our call and we'd like to end this with a little bit of a quick fire session. Just a few questions for you. Just some things. First thing that comes off your top of your head. Some are easy, some might be a bit more difficult. I'm going to go first. American buttercream or Swiss meringue buttercream? Oh, American buttercream. buttercream. <laughs> okay, Rachel. Uh, one aspect of baking you won't compromise on. Just being a high quality product. Excellent. Okay. A baking book from your bookshelf. I don't have one. Well, that's fine. I literally don't have one. I'm not even joking. I don't have baking books. 100% self I use my nan's recipe, the end. There we oh, go. Oh, well, I hope there's a book coming out of your nan's there's recipe. There's the book. <laughs> It's Jane Taylor's book. Well, I did say, just wait and see, Rachel. <laughs> and who would you want to make your next birthday cake? I don't eat cake, believe it or not. I don't actually like cake. So I would bring my nan back from the other side and get her to make me a gypsy tart. That's brilliant. A gypsy tart. And for anyone who doesn't know what a gypsy tart is, can you explain it? It's really sickly, but it's amazing. It's pastry base. Then you have evaporated milk and brown sugar which you beat for like 15 minutes in a whisk and you set it in the oven. It is phenomenal. It's a real Kentish pudding. Amazing. Do you have it with uh, an ice cream or Nothing. just on its own? Just that. All right, I got one last question for you. And this is, and I'm only throwing in this for you because you've given us a lot of interesting insight and you have access to a lot of other nuggets of knowledge from your association with Theo's SBS Challenge. One last piece of advice that you might want to give to anybody who's starting out in the baking world. Oh, just to think positively, have a positive mindset, the end. That's perfect. I think that's brilliant. Listen, Jane, thank you, honestly, so much. Really, really insightful. It's been a place and I'm really honoured you asked me, so thank you. It's been so insightful because it's not just applicable to bakers. I mean, a lot of what you said, I'm just sitting here mentally keeping notes for our it's own business, business of Olba, right? Like these are so many things that we can apply to ourselves. Yeah. And it's just been extremely useful for me and I really appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you very much. No, it's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. So Rachel, how was that for the Jane? That was quite something. Yeah, I'm you know, still processing all the wisdom and knowledge and tips that she's just shared in that podcast episode. But I think for me, having that positive mindset and very clear goals of where you want your business to go and boundaries for your business too came through in the entire chat. Yeah, it's we do this too, right? When we run Olber, we have visions, we have a strategy in place, we have things that we are willing to do and things that we don't want to do that people sometimes ask us to be a part of. But underlying all of that is a sense of a positivity, energy, that idea that, you know, we can do this. You have to believe in yourself, ultimately, right? This is her words. These are our words. If you don't believe in yourself, it just makes the mountain so much harder to climb. And, and I think Jane broke it down by, you know, how she plans her week, how she gets things done to make things a lot easier, where she finds the time to do all these activities from when she started in the beginning and to her journey now. And I think that there's so many tips there that a baker or someone in a similar position could apply back to their everyday life. Yeah, it's just invaluable stuff. And she's so kind because, you know, her idea of abundance giving out more than she holds back is just something that benefits everyone including me so i really enjoyed that yeah uh, i mean thanks jane i mean that was just the whole ethos of actually sharing that knowledge when you know she could keep all that information in for herself and use to gain and grow her business but her whole philosophy is to give back to everyone in the community and see everyone grow and seeing everyone grow means ultimately they grow and she also grows too that's right brilliant what thank great you Jane. Person, Jane. great person thank you so much for coming on and that wraps up episode one of my baking journey a podcast by Olba. 
Listen, that was our first episode. So if you did like it, please consider subscribing, rate us, and leave a review if you have a moment. If you want to learn more about Jane, you can follow her on Instagram. She's at Cakes by Jane Taylor. That's also in the show notes, so you can catch that there. We've got another seven episodes lined up for you every week, talking to more superstar bakers from around the world. And just to remind you, this podcast is produced by Olba. Who is Olba? Packaging for bakers, designed by a baker. Make a statement with Olba. Find out more at www.olba.shop. See you next week, guys. Take care.